That's a so straw man because no one says there's anything toxic about masculinity per se. What do you mean no one says that? People the the use... term exists. No. So what is your advice beyond banal comments like clean your room? Well, I do believe that women should have... I, I don't understand your question, I well, guess. I guess you <laughs> yeah. don't. That's pretty obvious, unfortunately. Well, how about if you phrase it more clearly instead of just insulting me? What is up guys, welcome back to Rattlesnake TV. I'm your host Jake and today I'm gonna to be discussing Jordan Peterson's 2019 appearance on Q&A Australia. Now it is bittersweet for me to bring this one to you today as I am an Australian and this for me was a terrible but accurate indictment on Australia's current state of affairs in regards to our cultural discourse and just how we go about discussing the big ideas down under. Now in terms of the entire appearance, there's a lot that could be covered so I've refined it as much as possible and I'll be focusing for the most part on Jordan Peterson's interactions with with Terry Butler. Now, Terry Butler is not just some random person, guys. She is an accomplished woman by anybody's standards. At the time of this episode of Q&A, she was a member of the House of Representatives in Australia for the Labor Party, which is the Australian left. And she was an industrial lawyer before that. So she is what we would regard as a mover and a shaker in Australian society. But as you'll see in this video, she was completely and utterly unable to even have the discussion with Jordan Peterson surrounding intensely important issues such as collectivism versus individualism and the current state of masculinity in society. So without further ado, let's get into it. People, particularly young men, appear to regard you and look to you as a saviour. What do you think they believe they need saving from? It's funny to regard me as a saviour because what I tell people consistently is that they have to look to themselves. Your best bet is to do what you can to take care of yourself properly, to treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping, which is rule two, by the way, partly because I do believe in this ancient, fundamentally Western idea that people are of intrinsic value. People are of intrinsic value. That's a very, very deep thing to say. And you might brush it off as something that's, yeah, I know, but people are of value, but that's not abundantly clear in today's day and age and in today's discourse. I mean, the atheist movement, for example, is bigger than it's ever been. And the fundamental premise of the atheist movement is that there is no grander meaning to life. You're basically just like a little flesh vehicle that's just roaming around the earth and there is no greater significance to life. And then we have the dehumanist movement, especially with the greenies who think that we need to save the planet and that people are a cancer on the planet and that you shouldn't have children. If you have children, you're morally wrong. So those few little words that he said there actually have so much gravity and it could be extrapolated upon for hours, but I digress. It isn't obvious to me that there is anyone or there has been anyone for the last four or five decades, let's say, who's done a credible job of drawing a relationship between the meaning in life that you need to sustain you and responsibility. And not just for you, because it's not an individualistic idea. It's responsible for you, responsibility for you and your family Coming up to and a minute your community. There, That'll do the trick. <laughs> and your broader society. So this is a perfect first question, in my opinion. It really allows Jordan Peterson to get to the crux of his philosophy, which is look to yourself. Take personal responsibility for your own life. And it actually addresses one of the main criticisms of him, which is incredibly frustrating for people who actually read his books and listen to his lectures and enjoy his work, which is that he has this sort of army of incels, an army of like angry, degenerate men who look at him as some god, and then their degeneracy is fueled by that behavior, and then they all hate women, which could not be further from the truth. I mean, Jordan Peterson is somebody who encourages personal responsibility. His philosophical guidances for young men are the very antithesis of what creates an incel. He tells people to take on a, as big a load as you possibly can, to take on the responsibility of getting your own house in order, getting your own room in order, and then eventually maybe one day you can help your family and you can eventually help your community. The idea of the incel or the resentful, bitter, joker-like character, that young man, is an affront to everything that he stands for. And this is what the feminists and the social justice warriors and the leftists who criticize him either don't understand or are willingly ignorant about. Let, let me just, can I, can I just, before we move on to the other panelists, can I just draw you to the, the final part of the question because there's this fascination that many young men have for your message. And uh, I, I guess he's suggesting our questioner there that's something to do with uh, th them needing saving from social Socialism, globalism and feminism. Is there any truth to that in your mind? Well, there is, there is truth to the idea that they might be, need a certain amount of existential rescuing from the idea that 
the West is fundamentally best characterized as an oppressive patriarchy, which is an absolutely, it's absolutely absurd proposition, and that as a consequence, whatever actions they might take that are forthright and ambitious in terms of participating in that system are by, by, by the very nature of the system destructive. It's very difficult for me to understand how anybody can be properly motivated if that's the fundamental view of society and, and male participation in it. And I don't buy any of that. I think the idea that the West is fundamentally an oppressive patriarchy is an appalling idea. And the notion that the proper way to view history is as a battleground between ethnic identities or identities in general or between men and women is it borders on the pathological. And so maybe it exceeds just merely bordering on the pathological. This is such an interesting and important topic that he's just raised here. He's saying that fundamentally, People think that Western society and Western culture can be categorized as an oppressive patriarch. And we hear this all the time, people saying how oppressed women have been since the dawn of time. And they say women have only just been recently liberated, etc, etc, etc. And while there are arguments within that argument that are true, it's not because of an oppressive patriarchy that these things happened. There are many different factors involved with the liberation of women into the workforce and towards having the vote. And people are so quick to assume that it's, oh, because men held them down. It's not the case whatsoever. Imagine living in 1915, for example, all the men are getting sent off to war to die. A lot of the time, if you're making a living for your family, if you're lower class, middle class, whatever it is, you are doing backbreaking work day in, day out, 12, 14, 15 hours a day in coal mines. Some of the worst life qualities you can imagine. People are dying young. Life was hard back then. And for us to look back today and say, oh, women couldn't enter the workforce because oppressive patriarchy, it's one of the worst ideas that's prominent today. For me, the problem that I have with kind of structural rigidity of gender roles for men and women is that they hurt men and they hurt women. They hurt both. Uh, they hurt the men who want to stay home longer with their kids. Uh, they hurt men in real physical ways because we do have a problem in this country where women are more likely to be violent, uh, the victims of violence at home. Mm. Men are more likely to be the victims of violence in public. But in both, the common factor is it's men committing the violence by, by and large, not exclusively, but by and large. And so these rigid kind of ideas of masculinity hurt everyone. And so when we talk about fem feminism, when we talk about changing those structures, it's to create an equality for, for the benefit of everyone and to get rid of some of the things that hold everyone back. No, it's not. If they cared about what really hurts men, they would not be labeling men who seek to be traditionally masculine as toxic. They would be celebrating and encouraging masculinity. They would be celebrating good fathers, good partners, strong men, successful men, competent men. But no, 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 you don't see any of that. And I'm gonna explore that in much greater detail very soon. You want a brief response to that, by the way? Well, the first thing I would say is that um, I'm not anti-feminist per se. I mean, I think the idea that the world would benefit from the movement of talent from both sexes into the workplace as rapidly as possible is something that anyone with any sense should share given the rather, uh, the rarity of talent and the necessity for for utilizing it. Mm. Um, I do stand by my original statement though that there's a brand of more radical feminism that, that insists that our culture is best characterized as an oppressive patriarchy. And I think that first of all, that that's an appalling sociological doctrine. And I think it has very negative psychological effects mm. and they won't be limited to men because in, if it's true that there's something toxic, let's say, about masculinity per se, what that will inev inevitably mean is that as women adopt more masculine roles, traditionally, what, what is that toxicity somehow going to go away? But that's a so straw man because no one says there's anything toxic about masculinity per se. What do you mean no one says that? People the the use... term exists. No, no, they... How is that a straw it's man? A well, but where did the term a, it's come from? It's a phrase from? that's used about forms of masculinity that are harmful to men and women. It's not about masculinity per se. You must know that. I read the American Psychological this. Association guidelines for the treatment of boys and men, and I know perfectly well that this is no strong ma straw man. And it's not only devoted towards what you might describe as the more aggressive ends of masculine behavior. It's aimed at at masculinity in a much broader in a much broader range of there's a much broader range of accusations that are underlying that are under the surface than that. 
And so I don't see in what way at all that it's a straw. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to pause that argument for a second. Yeah, and go to, uh... This is just such a typical feminist argument. They try so hard to obfuscate the truth of what they actually mean by toxic masculinity. And she'll sit there, straight faced, and say to Jordan Peterson, a live studio audience and the country, that nobody is calling masculinity toxic per se. And this is the problem with this toxic masculinity narrative. Toxic masculinity in itself is a misnomer. There's nothing toxic about masculinity. There's nothing toxic about being competitive. There's nothing toxic about being a protector, being a provider, being a leader, being competent, being driven and motivated. The people who push the toxic masculinity narrative hate men. It's simple as that. They hate men. They hate masculinity as a whole. So they hide their hatred of men behind the veil of toxic masculinity. But look, maybe she's got a point. Maybe I'm nuts and I've been missing something. So let's have a look. This is what happens when you Google the word statistics on masculinity. And don't take my word for it. Go and do it yourself. Go and Google it yourself and have a look what comes up. Measuring masculine norms to better understand the invisible barriers to women's inclusion. The Volatile Male Statistical Evidence for Toxic Masculinity by Joe Duncan. Jeez, I tell you what, that one surprises me because Joe Duncan does not look like the kind of guy that would hate masculinity. Australian study reveals the dangers of toxic masculinity to men and those around them. Young men who conform to traditional definitions of manhood are more likely to suffer harm to themselves and do harm to others, according to a new survey of Australian men aged 18 to 30. Harmful masculinity and violence, early socialization and negative masculine ideals, the connection between masculine culture and violence perpetration, the dangerous effects of toxic masculinity by Sarah Shepard, and it shows a guy with big muscles lifting weight. Wow, this is really attacking the radical ends of masculinity here. Toxic masculinity leaves young men feeling pressured to man up. One in five men will not reach the age of 50 in the Americas due to issues relating to toxic masculinity. Come to think of it, I stand corrected, guys. The term doesn't actually describe masculinity per se. Hi, my question is also for Peterson. And while I very much stand with the women's advocates in the room, my question is sort of on a different topic. You have a whole lot of uh, fans or former fans, kind of so-called now uh, ex-lobsters, uh, people like uh, Brendan Schiff. Um, and a lot of uh, these people talk about your, you have very simple answers to complex questions. You know, you, I think you often you know, talk about you know, individual responsibility over things that we, it's impossible for individuals to actually have responsibility over. You look at the extortionate uh, housing market, the precarious gig economy, like things that are well out of our control. So I want to know, what is your answer uh, to young people for some of the really big uh, uh, problems facing humanity, like the you know, climate catastrophe, like economic crisis, like the precarious job market? Because they just don't, like you talk all this much about uh, individual responsibility most of us are never going to be able to afford uh, to have all of these assets to have responsibility over. So what is your advice beyond banal comments like clean your room? Jordan Peterson is a better man than me. I don't know how he keeps his cool with these people. I mean, it definitely looks like he's keeping his cool on the outside, but I can imagine this is how he'd be feeling on the inside. Oh, you know... It's actually rather difficult to answer a question that ends with your comments are banal, <laughs> politely. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, would, I would consider that more of an opinionated personal and political statement than actually a question. So why don't you try reformulating that so that there's an actual question there. Peterson spent like 100 years writing Maps of Meaning, which is a book dedicated to going into great detail about how societies decay into tyranny and also how evil is at the heart of every human being. He has studied societies and people in such unbelievable breadth and detail throughout his career and has become an expert on behavioral psychology and sociology. And he studied these atrocities and these people throughout history through the lens of what if I was in that position? What would I do? And this is the big difference between Jordan Peterson and people like her. Jordan Peterson looks to the individual. He looks to himself. He says, what really lies at the heart of me? 
Where am I at in life? Whereas she would look at these big issues and think, I can't get a nice house. I don't have a high paying job. Climate change. Now, furthermore, Jordan Peterson is one of the world's foremost experts on behavioral psychology. He's been a professor at Harvard and the University of Toronto. He's been a clinician for decades and he's dedicated his life to understanding the most complex issues that you could possibly try and tackle. Issues such as what brings meaning to people's life, the relationship between science and religion, the true nature of human human beings, metaphysical ideas of good and evil. He studied all of the most difficult authors that you could possibly read from Nietzsche to Dostoevsky to Jung to Freud. And he fights against the big, difficult, complex ideas like Marxism, postmodernism, atheism. And I know this seems harsh, but it's such a good representation of the lack of attention span and nuance that goes into our discussion. This lady knows nothing about Jordan Peterson, nothing and she's decided to come here and call his comments banal. Like, does she really believe that he has millions of followers worldwide because he just tells people to clean their room? So what is your advice to young people when you talk about you need to be individually responsible, but when there are things that are so far out of our control, like climate catastrophe, like the precarious job economy, like you know, the They're economic crisis, what is your answer I mean, to people who are facing these questions? Do you think that you're worse off than your Do you think that you're worse off than your grandparents? I think there are different challenges. Do you think you're worse off than your grandparents? Uh, Jordan, once again, we're not going to cross-examine our <laughs> questioners. Uh, so try answering the question about collective responsibility on climate change, for example. Pick, pick one part of that. Uh, because the argument, I think, is that individual responsibility does not change um, the climate, does not fix the problem that needs global collective responsibility. So I think that's the core of the question. Do you have a, a theory about that? Well, fundamentally, I'm a psychologist, and my experience has been that people can do a tremendous amount of good for themselves and for the people who are immediately around them by looking to their own inadequacies and their own flaws and the things that they're not doing in their lives and starting to build themselves up as more powerful individuals. And if they're capable of doing that, and then they're capable of expanding their career. And if they're capable of expanding their career and their competence, then they're capable of taking their place in the community as effective leaders. And then they're capable of making wise decisions instead of unwise decisions when it comes to making collective political decisions. I'm not suggesting in the least and have never suggested that there's no domain for social action. I'm suggesting that people who don't have their own houses in order should be very careful before they go about reorganizing the world, which happens in many ways. <laughs> Can I just, just to... If a young person believes that the uh, climate, the global warming um, problem on the climate is something that needs to be tackled quickly and they can't wait until they grow up and become prime ministers to do it, do, do you think collective responsibility overrides individual responsibility in a huge issue like that? No. <laughs> OK. I don't. I, I think that generally, I think that generally, I think that generally people, I think generally people have things that are more within their personal purview that are more difficult to deal with and that they're avoiding and that generally the way they avoid them is by adopting uh, pseudo moralistic stances on large scale social issues so that they look good to their friends and their neighbors. That's what it looks like. <laughs> Are there groups that you think are more dangerous? There's a, it is, there isn't a problem with groups. Mm. The problem is with assuming that the fundamental way that you should categorize people is with their group identity. Mm. Obviously, we all belong to groups. The issue is whether or not the individual identity is primary and the group identity is secondary, or the group identity is primary and the individual identity is secondary. If you're a proponent, for example, of equality of outcome, of quotas, then you de facto accept the proposition that it's the group identity that is primary, and there's all sorts of dangers that are associated with that that far outweigh whatever good you're likely to do. Okay, well, maybe you just... <laughs> you just think that representative democracy should be representative. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just think that women should be equally represented in the decision-making fora of our nation. 
Maybe that's really just about having proper equality in a body that's meant to be representative. Well, I do believe that women should have... I, I don't understand your question, I well, guess. Well, I guess you <laughs> yeah. don't. That's pretty I obvious, don't. unfortunately. Well, how about if you phrase it more clearly instead of just insulting me? Once again, like, this is adults talking to children here. He's trying to have a proper discussion with her. He's actively listening. He's trying to understand her point of view. And then when he tries to further understand it, she just insults him and then laughs at him again. Look, 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 look at it this way. Let's talk about quotas for a minute. So there's a, a very wide array of jobs that are fundamentally uh, done by men. So, for example... Member of Parliament. 99.9% of sorry, bricklayers... I'm sorry, stop sledging you now, I You're promise. <laughs> I, I'm happy to give my minute to Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> 99.9% .9 of bricklayers are men. Should we have quotas for women? Is bricklaying representative democracy? That has nothing to do with the question. The question is if, 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 if there's evidence of structural inequality and oppression because women aren't precisely represented at 50% in all professions at all levels, then why don't we have a conversation about having women represented it? in all professions at all levels. Well, we Why do we talk about the C-suite, for example? Why do we talk about politics and positions of power? Mm. Why don't well, we talk about it across the board? Okay, we're so we're, about let's just pause and... and uh, yeah, but that's because it's power. About, you, you pose a question to Terry Butler, uh, <laughs> go ahead and answer it, then we'll hear from the other panellists. His question to me. Well, yeah, if you'd, about like, bricklayers. If, if you'd like to answer the question about bricklayers. There's nothing wrong with bricklayers. Why there are no of quotas course there's not. <laughs> Okay, so what he's saying is that why don't we have quotas and representation in all professions at all levels? Why only the politicians and why only the C-suite, the CEOs, the CFOs, the COOs? What about all of the bricklayers? What about all of the steel fixers? What about all of the carpenters? What about all of the concreters? Nobody ever talks about those guys. And you know why? Because those guys are out there breaking their backs every single day. But these feminists only want to talk about quotas with the good jobs, with the high paying jobs, with the air conditioned offices. And the question just goes straight over her head. Like she just was not listening at all. I think you were trying to draw a distinction between bricklaying and running the government. And I was suggesting that a representative democracy should be representative. That was the point I made. And I Represent think... Representative of it by quota? Well, sure, if that's what it takes. I mean, Yeah, it's well, that's exactly us. what you would say. That just, that, that, that just means well, a dreadful strategic inadequacy uh, on look, your I'm, really, I'm like, you steer, The Liberal Party steered away from quota. Yes. That's exactly what it means. A dreadful strategic inadequacy on your part. And you are a politician and you're so flippant about the idea of quotas. I don't think she understands the idea of collectivism at all. And that's why she's completely incapable of having this discussion. And like I said before, she's a mover and a shaker. She's a politician. She wields power in society. This is for Jordan initially. There has been an increasing trend here in Australia that anyone who has a counter view to the socialists PC, lobby, Greens, Communist Brigade. <laughs> your friend. You're shouted, on national television right uh, shouted now. down. Literally. Literally and called racists or homophobics. So that any form of rational debate is difficult, if not impossible, to now have. How can we counter this? Peter, I assume you're, you're, you're making an exception. <laughs> You're making exception for Q&A, I dare say, because we are having that debate as we speak. And I haven't you... been shouted down. There you go. <laughs> so, you're making progress, Tony. <laughs> Jordan Peterson. Or oh, you're wrong. Possibly you're just wrong. Jordan Peterson. Possible. Now, this guy's hilarious, and he's got a great point here. He's basically talking about cancel culture. He's saying that people can't really talk about what they want to talk about these days because they get shouted down. I mean, duh. Obviously, that's the world we live in right now, especially people who have conservative views and countercultural views to the mainstream narrative. That's just obvious. And since 2019, that's intensified tenfold, especially with the cough cough. But notice here that when he's making this argument, they're shouting him down. You're I shouted on national television right I shouted now. down. Literally. <laughs> or you're wrong. Possibly you're just wrong. Jordan Peterson. Possible. He's literally making an argument about the fact that people can't have opinions without being shouted down and they're shutting him down. Imagine what these people would do on Twitter. Your claim that if we engage in certain types of discussions, this kind of reaction emerges is absolutely the case. I mean, for at least six months after I 
made what you might describe as my initial political stance, I was swarmed by people who were using every possible pejorative to take me out so that none of my arguments needed to be taken seriously. Um, how do we deal with that? Well, hopefully we stop calling each other cheap names. That would be a nice start um, rather than addressing the issues. But I would also say a certain amount of persistence is called for. If you're mobbed on social media, a brief bit of advice by people who are doing exactly the sort of thing that you're describing, I would say two things. The first is um, be careful about what you've said and what you've said in the past, and maybe it's a bit too late for that. The second thing I would say is if you haven't done anything wrong, do not apologize. That's, that is your minute. Um, and then wait two weeks and it'll go away. Terry Butler. <laughs> So obviously Peterson's been a victim of this as well. He's been shouted down, he's been demonized, he's been vilified to no end from people who don't actually understand what he says at all. Or like I said before, they're willfully ignorant and just malicious. So I'll end it on this. Terry Butler saying she doesn't accept that people can't have an opinion in this country without being shouted down. I just don't accept that you can't have an opinion in this country without being shouted down. I mean, it just seems so, so silly, so silly, so silly. I shouted on national television right now. I shouted now. down. Literally. So silly. Or well, you're wrong. <laughs> possibly you're just wrong. Jordan Peterson. So silly. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you got some value out of that video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and do all that good stuff. And also leave me a comment. Let me know what debates you would like to see me break down in the future. So until next time, guys, I'm Jake, and this has been Rattlesnake TV.